Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Desire the pure milk of the word, that you may, like newborn babes, that you may grow thereby. His divine power has given to us all things pertaining to life and the spiritual life through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us this exceedingly great and precious promises, that through those you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Before we open God's word to Ephesians chapter 3 this morning, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, as we have sung these hymns focusing upon your goodness, your grace, your power, the fact that you sustain us throughout the worst of our experiences, the worst of times, we are so grateful for your grace. We do not deserve it as creatures who have sinned and rebelled, who continue to sin and rebel even as believers, but we are thankful for your grace that you have saved us in a way that is not dependent upon who we are or what we do or what we think, but is dependent upon the work of Christ on the cross, simply trusting in him. You have given us your word, not only the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate word, but also your written word. And it is on the basis of your written word that we are sanctified, as our Lord prayed in John 17, that we are to be sanctified by means of the truth. Thy word is truth. So, Father, we take this time to study the scriptures because these are the means, the information, the content of the scripture, which contains these exceedingly magnificent promises that we just heard about from uh, Peter, that it is through your word that we are transformed we are avoid as much as we can being pressed into the mold or conformed to the world system around us. And it is your word and your word alone through your grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit that transforms us into the image of Jesus Christ. And now, Father, we pray that you would help us to understand these wonderful things that the Apostle Paul has written about that are true for our lives, that should shape our understanding of who we are. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We are studying in Ephesians chapter 3, and we are studying in this section related to um, what to Paul, what has been revealed to Paul that he calls the mystery. And as we uh, look at Ephesians chapter 3, we see this emphasis on that which has been made known. We see an emphasis on being enlightened, and we see this emphasis on this new revelation that is given to us through the ministry of the Apostle Paul, as well as what he, this group he describes as the apostles and prophets, which speaks of the uh, New Testament prophets, and so the foundation of the church has to do with the apostles and the prophets. So we are looking now this morning, we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 3, and we're going to step back just a little bit to catch the context of verse 6, but primarily going down into verses uh, 10, 11, 12, and 13. That slide is not right, so I'm skipping it. Ephesians 3, 6, and 7. Let me just focus our attention back on this immediate section, 6 through 13, so that we can think about what Paul is saying here as we wrap this section up. He says in verse 6 that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of this promise in Christ through the gospel. Now, the gospel is the good news. Sometimes we don't always act like it's good news, but it's the good news, the great news, that Christ has died on the cross for us and that we can have eternal life. And if when we get a grip on what that means, 
This is something we should clearly want to tell the world about. And so the focus here is that it is through the gospel that there is a change in the relationship of Jew and Gentile. Of course, we studied that all the way through from chapter 2, verse 11, down to the end of that chapter, that this is this new entity that has come into existence. And so uh, as, as Paul talks about this, this is his focus is on this new entity that he describes as a, a, a new man, a new body, a new household of God, and a new temple, four different metaphors. And we've been in this section, I think, for about four or five months. But this is so profound. Uh, the, the, there are sections and verses in here that are used as proof texts for so many different uh, teachings or doctrines of the Scripture related to the church, related to this dispensation, and related to the purpose of God in this dispensation. That it is uh, one of the most significant chapters or sections in all of Scripture. But here, Paul talks about the gospel. And in verse 7, he says, of which, and that relative pronoun which refers back to the gospel. So of this gospel, he is saying, I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. And that power is his omnipotence. And the point that he is making here is that at the point of his salvation, when he trusted in Christ, when he was on the road to Damascus and Jesus Christ appeared to him in a bright light, he saw Jesus Christ as the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. He saw him physically, bodily, in terms of his resurrection. It wasn't just something that appeared that if he had stuck his hand out, it would have passed through this immaterial image. No, it was a, a physical, material appearance of the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ who said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he was persecuting the church. And so even there, Jesus is identifying the church, church age believers, as his body. They were persecuted. Paul was persecuting Christ by persecuting, uh, persecuting the church. And it was at that time that, that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, commissions him as an apostle. He is gifted with the spiritual gift of apostleship. And this is what he describes as the gift of the grace of God which was given to me. And we've studied this phrase in detail at previous times in this, this section, that this is not talking about his salvation. This is talking about that which came with his salvation, his spiritual gift of apostleship, his mission and his commission as an apostle, and his mission to take the gospel to the Gentiles, that this wasn't uh, the only group he was to take the gospel to, but he was to take it to the Gentiles, and he is distinctively uh, stated to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But we look at this word gospel, and you may not realize it, but there is, as there has been for almost 2,000 years, a lot of confusion over this term. What is the meaning of the word gospel? And in various passages, you have to be careful because the way we use gospel is in a rather restrictive sense. In other words, we're answering the question, what must I do to not go to the lake of fire and to go to heaven when I die? And that is what we identify as the first stage or phase one of salvation. There are three different meanings to salvation. Dr. Earl Rodmacher, who was the president of Western Conservative Baptist Seminary for many years, used to call it the three tenses of salvation. That we have been saved, we are being saved, and we will be saved. And so stage one is justification. What must I do to be just before God? How can I, as a sinner, be righteous before God. 
And we can't do anything. This is why Paul writes in Titus 3, 5, it's not by works of righteousness which we have done that he saved us, but by the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. It is a reference to the fact that it, this is a work of God, not a work of man. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're told that, that he who knew no sin, the Lord Jesus Christ, was made sin for us, that the righteousness of God may be found in us. And so at the instant of faith in Christ, we are given, we are imputed is the technical term, we are reckoned to be righteousness. God the Father, as it were, the illustration from Zechariah 3 with Joshua the high priest putting on a new robe, that is the picture. We are clothed positionally as righteous. We have put on a new garment. It's interesting, as you know, I'm teaching on Monday nights with church history, and we'll be back to that tomorrow night. But one of the things that they did that was, uh, had significance in the early church in relation to baptism was that they would uh, take these the new converts and they put them through a course of study, catechesis, we get the word catechism from that, a course of study to prepare them for, for baptism. They did these baptisms only once a year. They did them on the Saturday morning at dawn between the, on the Saturday between Good Friday and Resurrection Day and, and Easter. And it was a rigorous time of study. They would take 40 days between, um, uh, before that day to train them and to teach them and to instruct them. Some of the instruction we would say, well, that's not quite right. Our early church fathers didn't have it all together. Trust me, they had a lot of confused ideas. Everything from physical washing of sin to baptismal regeneration. They had these different ideas. But, in, in, but this 40-day period was where we get the concept of Lent. Now, that wasn't what they were doing then, but that's what it eventually uh, developed into was this concept of Lent. And then on, the, on that Saturday morning, long before dawn, they would uh, the new uh, baptismal candidates would come and the men were separated from the women because they were baptized naked. And in the baptistry, which was separate from the church, you know, if you grew up in a Baptist church, you know they have the baptistry up behind the pulpit. I was in my first church, and, and the, the baptistry was actually under uh, the, the platform. Uh, uh, and, and I always thought, well, is there a string somewhere that somebody's going to pull, and if I don't say the right thing, I'm going to get dunked? But that's where their, their baptistry was. But in the early church, it was an, a, a separate building. And it was designed so that the men and the women were, were kept separate from one another. And what they would do is they would go and they would go in, and the first thing they would do is they would take off their garments. And then after they were immersed, they would put on a new garment. Now, I'm not sure how well they taught what this was all about, but the symbolism was that we have put off the old man, and when we are saved, uh, this is Romans 6, which is referencing the, the baptism by the Holy Spirit, that what happens when we trust in Christ is the old man dies, what we were before we were saved. The trouble is we still have a sin nature. The old man is everything we were before we were saved, and we become a new creature in Christ, and so they would put on this new garment. And that's what that symbolized. And so in some ways, they were, they, they were on target. And unfortunately today, the purpose for baptism has been lost, but it is to teach a very abstract doctrine, which is our position in Christ, our new identity in Christ, that we are new creatures in Christ, through a very concrete uh, symbolism of being immersed in the water, which is to be identified with Christ in his death and burial. And the result of that is we are cleansed of sin and become positionally cleansed and positionally forgiven. And then as we come up out of the water, that is identification with his resurrection, his new life, which is the foundation for understanding our sanctification. And that's what we see in 
uh, in baptism, and that's how we teach it here at West Houston Bible Church. And it is a purpose is, just like the Lord's table, is to teach through these symbols so that people can come to understand uh, these abstract doctrines. In phase two, phase two, we have the spiritual life. Now, what's important is to understand that phase one and phase two are not connected. This is a problem you have in Roman Catholic theology. In Roman Catholic theology, you don't know if you're saved phase one unless you see it in phase two. And so they run concurrently. They are connected together. They haven't distinguished the two. But justification takes place in a millisecond, a nanosecond. When we trust in Christ, we are declared just. And that does not necessitate our spiritual growth afterward. This is a, a, a holdover from Roman Catholicism within the tradition of Reformed or Calvinistic churches, and others have picked this up, and we all fall prey to that. We see somebody and we hear them say something or live a certain way, and they um, we look at them, we say, how can that person be saved? Look at what they said. Look at what they've done. Uh, that person has, has denied Christ. Uh, you can't. They go to First John and they take a verse out of context and say, see, you can't deny Christ and be a, be a true believer. But they forget the fact that, that any believer, every believer still has a sin nature and every believer can commit every single sin he could commit before he was a believer. And there are believers who never hear very much about how to grow after they are saved. They never understand phase two. They only understand phase one. And they continue living and thinking and acting and talking just like they did as an unbeliever. And there are some believers who do grow some, and then they decide that they are really attracted to the world, and they go right back to it, and they are exemplified in Scripture in the parable of the, of the two sons, the prodigal son. And there are a lot of, a lot of believers who are living like the prodigal son, and they are wallowing in the pigsty with nothing to eat but the husks of corn because they've rejected grace. But they are still saved, just as the prodigal was still the son of his father. He was still saved. He still had, uh, he had squandered his inheritance, but he was still saved. So when he goes back, eventually, uh, the father welcomes him back because he is still part of the family. And so we have to understand that concept of grace. Phase one is separated from phase two, which is our spiritual life, our spiritual growth. And it is not inevitable and necessarily the result of phase one. This is where you get into the problems that hold over from Roman Catholic theology and into what we call lordship theology, that if you're not growing spiritually, well, how do you know? How do you quantify it? How do you measure it? How do you know? Because fruit can be imperceptible. In fact, if you are a gardener and you grow anything that bears fruit, from the time that you plant the seed and a seedling comes up until the time that this plant has grown and matured enough to bear fruit, 60, 90, 120 days goes by. So that the bearing of fruit is the product of a mature plant. The bearing of fruit in the spiritual life is the product of maturity. It is not immaturity. It is not something you see with, with brand new be believers because they don't have any content yet. So we have phase two, and eventually there's phase three, which is our glorification when we are absent from the body and we are face to face with the Lord. And if you are justified, then it is inevitable that you will be glorified. That's what Romans 8, 28, and 29 is all about. So we talk, also talk about it this way in terms of the three tenses of salvation. At phase one, we are saved from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is the fact that God declared to Adam and Eve in the garden that on the day at the time, that's just a Hebrew idiom for at that instant, you will die if you eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At that instant, you will die. Well, they didn't die physically. And so what happened is that they died spiritually because something did happen. And that's indicated by the fact that when God came to, uh, to them in the garden, 
that they ran and hid because they were afraid. Now, they were never afraid before, and they never hid from God before. So that tells us what happened, is that they were alienated from the life of God, and they were alienated from God, separated by God, and that is what we mean by spiritual death. Uh, so spirit, every person is born spiritually dead, but that's the judicial penalty that God assigned to disobedience, so that we're all born spiritually dead, separated from God, under that penalty uh, that will eventually come of eternal uh, spirit, spiritual death. But we're saved from that penalty. Christ, when he died on the cross for our sins, paid that penalty in full to telestai. In the spiritual life, as we grow, this is what Romans 6, 7, and 8 are all about. We are saved from the power of sin. We are to consider ourselves dead to sin. That is separated from its power. That's what is symbolized in baptism when we're separated from, uh, from uh, uh, the world. We're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection so that there is that separation from who we were before we were saved. It is a legal position before God. Uh, that's what happens at that instant of salvation, but we have to consider ourselves dead to sin. We have to understand that's the reality of who we now are. We have put off the old man, and we are to put on the new man. And we are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice it's grace and knowledge. You have to have knowledge. Now, we live in the information age, and there are a lot of people who confuse information with knowledge. And you can get out on the Internet, and you can search on any number of things and find all sorts of disparate and contradictory opinions on everything, which can lead you to a certain level of skepticism. Can we know anything? In this last year, as we have gone through this uh, pandemic with the COVID-19, all of us have experienced the fact that, that you, if you get 20 experts, you get 30 opinions because they change their minds a lot. And so there are, you can get in a debate with anybody and you can both cite 10 world-renowned experts that say that you must wear masks and, in fact, let's double up on them. And then you can find 10 world-renowned experts who say masks don't do anything. And, and we're just left going, well, who do we trust? And you go through series, uh, question after question of so many things, and how do we know what happened? You look at politics and the fake news, and, and one person says this, the other person says just the opposite. Where do we go to learn truth? Well, one thing that I know is when I'm in the Scriptures, I know I have truth. And I know exactly what, what it means, and I can understand that. And so we are identified with Christ, we're given this new identity, and we have to consider ourselves, reckon is the way the, new, or the King James translated, reckon ourselves dead to sin. That is separated from the power of the sin nature. So as we grow spiritually, which is summarized, I think, in Romans uh, 12, uh, 1 and 2, it says, do not be conformed to the world. Don't be pressed into the mold of the culture's norms and standards and way of living, but be transformed by the renovation, the overhaul, the transformation of your mind, uh, your thinking. That is, you have to get rid of all the old garbage and put in the truth of God. And that is what uh, sanctifies us. So we're saved from the power of sin. And then when we die physically, or if we're part of the rapture generation at that instant, we are absent from the body, face to face with the Lord, and we no longer have a sin nature to deal with. Some of us are going to look in the mirror and wonder who that is, because once that sin nature and its consequences is removed, we, we, we're not sure who we are anymore. Uh, that's going to be very interesting for most of us. So these, this teaching all of this is Paul's concept of the gospel here. Not just phase one, what must I do to have eternal life, but all of this is the good news, the great news of uh, 
our salvation. That, that includes all three of those things. So when he says in verse 7, of which that is the gospel, I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given, that is this commission to proclaim the good news that Jew and Gentile are now united together in one body. How many of us have ever mentioned that when we were answering the question, how do I get to heaven? None of us. That's because it's not part of the phase one message. It's part of the phase two message. And, and so that's why I say when he talks about the gospel here and we see the, the use of, his, uh, of the word here where it says that I should preach, that's evangelizo, where we get our word evangelism. And so he's clearly talking about proclaiming the good news, but it's not that narrow good news of what must I do to go to heaven when I die, but it's the broad good news that includes how to be born again and what the born-again person should do to continue to, to uh, grow spiritually. So he says, To me, uh, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should evangelize, I should proclaim the good news uh, among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Now, when I retranslate this, I have changed this, that I should... Uh, Proclaim the good news, comma, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Because the phrase, the unsearchable riches of Christ, is appositional. That means it is explaining the content of what he is proclaiming. The unsearchable riches of Christ isn't the message of how do I get saved and go to heaven when I die. The unsearchable riches of Christ has to do with all of the wonderful things that God did for us at salvation that we can develop and exploit, all of the assets that he has given us that we can grow spiritually. So he, it should be translated, um, should proclaim the good news, comma, which is, or appositionally just comma, the unsearchable wealth of Christ, among the Gentiles are to the Gentiles. And to make all see what is the administration, it's not the word fellowship, that was only in a few manuscripts, which are the foundation of the Textus Receptus of the King James, but, but the majority, vast majority of manuscripts have a, a, a oikonomia there. The administration of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Christ. So this is the mystery previously unrevealed uh, doctrine. It was hidden. God didn't tell anybody. God didn't, the, the angels didn't know, Satan didn't know, fallen angels, no human being in the Old Testament ever had a concept of what was going to take place in the future with regard to the body of Christ. And, and again, note the emphasis on creation. Uh, from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Creation is not some secondary doctrine. I've had arguments with Christians that say, well, that's just so distracting. The, the, the foundation of the Bible is Genesis 1, 1, and 2. And how many times do you have the God's work of, as creator referred to throughout the rest of the Old Testament. If you think creation is a secondary doctrine, then, then you haven't learned very much about the Bible. Again and again and again, that's what distinguishes the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Jesus Christ, the God of Christians, from all of the pagan uh, gods and goddesses. And then verse 10, to the intent or for the purpose that now the manifold or the multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenlies. And then verses 11, 12, and 13, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. God had a plan, he had a purpose, and he accomplished that in Christ Jesus. And this purpose included this previously unrevealed information, this mystery doctrine, 
about the church age. And then Paul can't avoid saying something new about what we have in Christ. He says, in whom, that is, in Christ, we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. So we now have this new position which gives us the boldness and the confidence to come into the heavenlies. We'll talk, and I mean, to come before God's throne of grace and find mercy and help in time of need. We have direct access to the Father. And then he finally comes back to finishing the sentence he started in verse 1. And he says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. So, now I've spent some time on this already, but just to recap, this is how I've retranslated verse 8. This grace was given to preach the good news, to proclaim the good news, to announce the good news. It is evangelizo. It's not, uh, not kerugma or kerux, which is usually translated preach. That's the primary word, which means to proclaim as a herald going through a town would announce the news. And it is not didaskala, didas, yeah, didaskalao, which is the word for teaching. It's not instruction. It is an announcement of good news, telling people the gospel. And that gospel includes, this is why I make this breakdown exegetically between a narrow gospel of just what must I do to have eternal life and not go to the lake of fire, is that this includes the unsearchable riches of Christ, so that it's much more than just the message of how do I get to heaven when I die. It is talking about the wealth that becomes ours when we trust in Christ and how to exploit that in our Christian life and our Christian walk. And so we have an, uh, uh, two verbs here. They're actually infinitives, verbals, to proclaim the good news at the end of verse 8 there and to reveal to all what is the administration of the mystery. So those are your main ideas here. And the reason I'm, I'm saying that uh, and making a point out of that grammatically is all of this is one long sentence, and we know how the Apostle Paul is when it comes to the long sentences. When we get to verse 10, we're going to read, um, to the intent that now, what, what is to the purpose? What is for this purpose? That the multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known. It has to go back to these two infinitives. I mean, there's a lot in between, but it has to go back to these two infinitives, that the reason Paul is given this in pro proclaiming the good news of the gospel and revealing all that is going on in this dispensation, this administration of the mystery, is for this purpose of manifesting uh, the multifaceted wisdom of God to the angels, to the principalities and the power. So he is, he's got two purposes he states through these uh, infinitives to, first of all, to evangelize the Gentiles, because he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Is he ignoring the Jews? No, he's not. He, he, every time he went to a new city, he went to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. He goes to the synagogues. Why? Because they have the Old Testament scriptures. They know the prophecies of the Messiah. And he can start there with them because they know who the true God is. And they know uh, the basics of Old Testament prophecies and Messianic prophecies. And he can start there to show that those were fulfilled in Jesus Christ. It always created a division and so he's kicked out, but a number of them will go with him, and that forms the, the, the seed of a new congregation. So he evangelizes the Gentiles, and he is revealing or disclosing this new information about this dispensation, that God's doing things differently now, Jew and Gentile are united, uh, united together. And the purpose for this is given then in verse 10, to the intent or for the purpose that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church uh, 
to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. Now, I took a lot of time to go through this concept of the principalities and powers as the different descriptions of the different hierarchies of authority within the angelic ranks, both the elect angels and the fallen angels. So they're all learning something by watching us, that is, the church, but specifically now in this church age generation. So what makes it, it different now? that they couldn't learn before. Think contextually. It's this new entity of Jew and Gentile together as one body, one new man, one body, one new body, one household of God, one new temple. And so this, we are the object of the scrutiny of both elect angels and fallen angels, the demons. They're learning something about God. He's teaching. He's, di uh, he's got us on display for a purpose. And this word that is translated now. Now, I know some people are going to say, well, you're pushing the case a little bit here. I understand that. But it's, uh, it, it, I think it's th this may very possibly be, be the case. He says, to the intent that now. Uh, the manifold wisdom of God might be known to the church. And this word now is the Greek word noon. And this is where you, you, sometimes we split things kind of close. The word, there are two words in Greek for now, for, for now. There's the word noon, and there's another word, rt. And in a lot of cases, they overlap. So if I were to have a di diagram up here, I would have two intersecting circles, but there would be a big area of overlap. Now means now in a lot of cases. But in some cases, uh, where both words are used in context, and they're not both used in this context, where they're both used in, in the context, they have a different sense. For example, at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, 13, in verse 11, he says, now we see through a mirror enigmatically. And it's the word RT. And in verse 11, he's talking about the fact that these gifts, knowledge, wisdom, tongues, are, or, that were partial or incomplete are, are now abolished. And tongues will cease. And he is saying, but now we see through this mirror enigmatically a reference to God's revelation that it's incomplete and it's insufficient and so we don't really see the whole picture yet. The mirror is only halfway built so that we can't see ourselves fully and accurately. And then in verse 13, he talks about what does continue. And he uses this other word, nuni, now. So the first is, but now we see through a mirror darkly. In other words, he's saying now in this very narrow time frame right now, while we don't have a complete scripture, we see through the uh, see in this mirror enigmatically. And then he says, "But now," and he uses Nuni, and it's a broader now. But he says, "But now in this church age, what abides? What continues?" And that's in contrast to what he said before: that wisdom is incomplete, knowledge is incomplete. But when the perfect comes, that which is incomplete will be done away with. So, so these revelatory gifts, wisdom, and knowledge will be done away with when something comes. Well, it has to be in kind. And so that would mean that, that it's some revelation that completes things so that wisdom and knowledge are no longer incomplete. So we have the giving of the Word of God. What continues? Not tongues, not knowledge, not wisdom, what continues in the church age and characterizes the church age are faith, hope, and love. Now, in this church age, abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Now, some people interpret the perfect as the being in the presence of God in one way or another, at the rapture, at death, second coming, whatever it might be. But the reality is that Romans 8 says that hope that is seen is not hope. So hope when we're face-to-face -face with the Lord, our hope is seen. So hope doesn't exist anymore once we're face-to-face -face with the Lord. Faith. 
Uh, faith is the evidence of things not seen. But when we're face to face with the Lord, they are seen. So you, we won't be operating on faith and we won't have hope when we are in heaven because our hope is realized and we're face to face with the Lord. So there's no more need for faith. It's not the evidence of things not seen. We're seen. So the reality is that faith, hope, and love are not talking about what's going to abide in heaven, but what's abiding here on the earth in the church age. And it clearly then means that there are some of these gifts, revelatory gifts, tongues, are cease with the completion of the canon. So the now here in verse 10, I, it's that same word. So I think that Paul is using this in the same way that Nuni means now in this church age, in this administration of the mystery of God, the manifold wisdom, po polu poikilos, poikilos is where we get our word polka dot. Just thought you needed to know that. It means something that is variegated, something that is different. And so it's talking about the many facets of a of God's wisdom. And what always comes to my mind when I think of this many-faceted thing, like you think about a many-faceted sphere. Yeah, I just can't get it out of my head. You know what I'm talking about, a disco ball. You know, and it would spin and reflect all the light. That's the many-faceted idea here. There are untold millions, billions of of facets, little faces to God's wisdom. And so we have to understand what that means. We've talked about the fact that this is being made known. How is it being made known? It's through the church, through us. Who's it being made known to? The principalities and powers is being made known to the angelic hosts, fallen as well as elect. But what does it mean that this manifold wisdom of God, and uh, it's being made known, it's demonstrated. So I want to talk about this first, and we'll come back and talk about what wisdom is. It's made known. This is the word norizo, which is a broad general term for just making something known that wasn't known before. The word that we talk about in terms of revelation, uh, uh, apocalypsis in, in, in the Greek, it means to make something known that wasn't known before. So, so norizo is just a, a broad general uh, term for that. And he is making this known. And this word uh, norizo is also a synonym in one of its senses with a more precise word that we studied in previous lessons in Ephesians 2.7, indeknumi. And this is a word that really has a legal sense of bringing evidence before a court and laying out the evidence. Indegnumi means to demonstrate a truth, to prove something, to exhibit it so that people can learn from it. And so that's what he, Paul talks about back in chapter 2. Uh, we are saved. Okay, what happens when we're saved? We are uh, given new life in Christ. We are made alive together in Him. We are buried with Him, raised with Him, and we, excuse me, we're raised with Him and seated together with Him in the heavenlies. We are made alive together with Him. We are uh, raised with Him and seated together with Him in the heavenlies. That's the church age. That's what happens with us positionally in Christ. That's related to what happens with our at, at the time that we're saved with the baptism uh, by the Holy Spirit. Incidentally, the parallel passage over in Colossians 2:12 to 14 also makes that point uh, a little more clear than Ephesians 2:7 uh, does. But this is demonstrating this. So this is, we're put on. We're, we are evidence in the trial of the fall of Satan and the angels. God is demonstrating something about his grace, his wisdom uh, to the angels. And so he's showing these exceeding riches of his grace. Now, we have a lot of phrases here in, the, in Ephesians that talk about this, that, that all of this is to the praise of the glory of his grace in Ephesians 1.6 that it is for the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, the wealth of the glory of his inheritance in the saints in 118, 
in uh, 119, the exceeding greatness of his power. In 119b, the working of his mighty power. In 24a, God who is rich in mercy. In 24b, because of his great love with which he loved us. And then 25b, by God's grace. Over and over again, all of this speaks of the gr grace of God. This is what is being put on display is God's grace right now. And he's teaching something to the angels about his grace and the significance of his grace so that if, if the fallen angels or Satan were to try to make the case that how can a good, loving God send his creatures to the lake of fire, God says, look at me, display my grace. You guys just abused it and destroyed it and there are consequences for doing that. And because it's so serious to abuse my grace, the, that's why the, the penalty is so so horrible. So he is demonstrating this legally, this indicates uh, t to the angels. He may, and, and this is what is made known by the church uh, to the principalities and powers. Now, let's talk a minute about this word wisdom, the manifold wisdom of God. The verb is, is chacham, in the Hebrew, it's a ch at the beginning, it's a chet, and a k in the middle. And it has to do with making wise. But we have to understand what wisdom is in, in the Bible. A minute ago, I referred to we live in an age where we confuse information with knowledge. Well, people also confuse knowledge with wisdom. Information is not knowledge. We can get all kinds of information off of the internet, but that doesn't mean we know anything. Knowing is a result of process of learning and making it part of our thinking. So information isn't knowledge, but knowledge isn't wisdom. Wisdom is the creative and powerful application of knowledge to a situation. So that wisdom has this idea of, of skillfully taking the principles, the truths that you know, and applying them in different ways, in different situations in your life, which in turn produces a work of art in our lives. It produces something of beauty. That's what wisdom is. It is often translated uh, skill. And we I have some examples here. In Exodus 28, verse 3, as Moses is being instructed by God on how the tabernacle is to be built, he tells him also that he is going to um, give certain skill to the craftsmen who are going to make everything. The head of the craftsmen were, were Aholiab and uh, Bezalel. And God gives them wisdom that is skill at woodworking, skill at metalworking, working with the jewels, working with the gold and the silver, skill in the uh, weaving of the fabrics and the embroidery of the fabrics. It, it produced something that was incredibly beautiful. And so we have passages like Exodus 28.3 where God says to Moses, so you shall speak to all who are gifted that's hacham, gifted, or wise, but it's skillful. That's really the, the sense of what wisdom is biblically. It's not the Greek concept uh, of an Aristotle or a Plato or a Socrates. It is the skill at developing or applying something. So you shall speak to all who are gifted, wise, skillful artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, chokmah, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And if Exodus 35, 25 says, all the women who were gifted, that it's the word hacham, wise or skillful artisans, spun yarn with their hands as they did all the material for the curtains and everything. Uh, Exodus 36, 1, and Bezalel and Aholiab and every gifted, every hakam, every... Um, skillful artisan in whom the Lord has put, notice the Lord puts this skill in them, it puts this wisdom, this chokhmah and understanding to know how to do all manner of work for the service of the, of the sanctuary. So this is the idea of, of, um, of wisdom. 
And it is to take things in our life, the things we learn from Scripture, and to apply them to the circumstances of life so that it creates something beautiful. Now, we have a promise in James 1.5, in verses 2, 3, and 4, talks about the fact, count it all joy when you encounter various trials or tests, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. James 1.5 addresses the fact that, well, what if I hit these trials and tests of my faith and I don't really know what to do? Then pray about it. He says, but if anyone is deficient in wisdom, if you don't know enough to apply to the situation to create something beautiful and artistic for God, uh, then ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reprimand, and it will be given to him. Now, when I was a junior in high school, I had a day when I had finals in chemistry and algebra, and as you know, I'm not a numbers guy, and I'm not really a science guy, and I wasn't going into the chemistry final with great grades, and I prayed a lot that God claimed this promise. Now, that was erroneous. And God didn't answer that prayer because, you know, that wasn't what the promise was about. So, but this is about wisdom in applying God's word to the tests of faith. And so God gives it generously, graciously, without reprimand, and it will be given to him. Now, all of this goes back to understanding what, how Paul ended the first part of Ephesians 2, that we, the church, Jew and Gentile, together, we are his workmanship. And I covered this when we went through there. This is the Greek word poema, which is where we get our word poem which is a beautiful way of crafting language. So it has to do with creating something that is a beauty, creating something that is a work of art, creating an artistic masterpiece. That's what God is creating in the church, and that uh, we are to walk in good, good works. So, so three things stand out for us in summary. First of all, God is creating a masterpiece. And that masterpiece is the uniting of Jew and Gentile together in this one new body designated as the body of Christ. But it's identified in 2.11 to 22 as a new man, a new household, and a new temple. This is something of beauty. This is who we are. This is our spiritual identity in the church. Second, wisdom is another term used to identify Christ in many Old Testament passages. Uh, in 1 Corinthians also draws our attention to God's wisdom in the plan of salvation. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 1, Paul says, but we preach, we proclaim Christ crucified. This is phase, the phase one message, Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. Now we have heard that there are some in the free grace movement who have opted for what we call a crossless gospel. And that was divisive, uh, so divisive back in uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago, almost destroyed Schaefer Seminary because some of the faculty members and some of the uh, other uh, leaders w had bought into this. And we took a very, very strong stand, the board did, and George Meisinger did, that, that we have to preach the cross in Christ crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.23, Paul says, We preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jew and, Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Christ is the wisdom of God. So part of what Paul is getting at in and there in Ephesians 3.10, the manifold or multifaceted wisdom of God is Christ, is the center of that. Second, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, so he's connecting it to the mystery doctrine in 1 Corinthians 2, 7, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So these things stand out here. Uh, the second thing is that this relates to the grace of God in this church age. The body of Christ, uh, or B rather, the body of Christ, the church, never before seen in history, not anticipated, not expected, not prophesied, 
that's part of the wisdom of God and see the grace of God in this church age. It is beyond anything seen before. Now, there was grace in the Old Testament. John chapter 1, John says, but with, in, with Christ uh, came grace, but there was grace in the Old Testament. And so the result of this is verse 12, which we will come back to next time with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study this passage and dig out all the richness and wealth that is here. Father, help us to understand our identity in Christ that we are identified with his death, burial, and resurrection so that the power of the sin nature is broken. And yet too often, rather than considering ourselves dead to sin, we consider ourselves alive to sin, and our lives, our thinking, are not much different from unbelievers. But there is to be this transformation that takes place. But it's not apart from your word, it is through your word. We are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for anyone who is here that is unsaved or someone who's listening to this message that doesn't know how to get to heaven, that the message is clear. It's simply by faith in Christ Jesus, trusting him alone. Faith alone, not faith plus works, not faith plus cleaning up your life, just trusting in Christ alone. And it's Christ's work exclusively that saves us. And Father, we pray God the Holy Spirit would make that message clear to anyone who needs salvation. Father, we pray for us that we might uh, take this message to heart, transforming our lives because we are indeed new creatures in Christ. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Let's stand together for our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 483B, The Word of God Shall Stand. When we finish, I'm going to ask Alan just to go ahead and close in prayer for us, and then we will um, have a break so that you can gather up your kids or whatever, and then we're going to have our congregational meeting. Let's stand, number 483B.